happened yesterday in Egypt. Incredible turn of events yeah. yesterday in Egypt. Thousands of anti-government <laughs> protesters are packed into Cairo's main square this morning, while others have gathered outside the city's presidential palace. The demonstrations come a day after a defiant President Mubarak refused to step down, despite widespread speculation that he would resign. In his speech last night, Mubarak announced he was transferring some powers to his recently appointed vice president, Omar Suleiman. But he didn't specify which powers, and the statement mostly drove home his determination to cling to power. I have told you my determination that I will hold, st hold steadfast to continue to be, take on my responsibility to protect the Constitution and the rights of people until power is transferred to whomever the people chooses in, during September, the upcoming September. All right, protesters last night reacted angrily to that announcement, chanting, get out, get out, before Mubarak's speech was over. But Suleiman urged demonstrators to go home. I call on all the citizens to look forward to the future. Go back home. Go back to your work. Do not listen to the uh, satellite television stations whose main purpose is to fuel sedition and drive a wedge among the people. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not they're not going work. home, by the way. Opposition leader Mohamed El Baradei warned of potential violent unrest, saying on Twitter, quote, Egypt will explode. Army must save the country now. Okay, seriously, Mike, Mike Barnacle, this guy, this guy is now officially becoming the Chalabi of, of Egypt. Well, the, El Baradei, putting himself in the middle of this, and people don't, and don't want it. And the military, be careful. They are all living on the planet Mubarak. I mean, they're, they're all so isolated or removed from reality, it's almost beyond belief. And the yeah. people, once again, feel like they've been duped. They feel like this is more of the same with Mubarak. Right. Um, we should get to Richard Haas. No, no, I mean, it's obviously in, in, the, in all the newspapers, not only in America, but across the world. This is the story right now, mm -hmm. and it is a real crisis for this White House, who I think most of us agree that, at least through the early stages of this crisis, uh, have done a good job, saying as little as they can, They've got an ally of 30 years uh, that they don't want to offend. And more importantly, Richard Haas in uh, New York, they've get, uh, is he in Washington? Yeah. Where well, are you? So you're, you're, you, you're not at home in New York, but you couldn't make it to Chicago? Why do you hate <laughs> Chicago so much, Richard Haas? Oh, Hoss? come on. <laughs> are there no Council on Foreign Relations members in Chicago here? Uh, oh, there so are, anyway, actually. Richard... Yeah, I, I, I figured that. So, uh, Richard, what, what exactly does the White House do moving forward? They've already had some pushback from the Saudis and other allies in the Middle East. Uh, how do they respond to yesterday's uh, terrible turn of events? Well, the way they did respond, Joe, was angrily. The statement the, the White House put out last night uh, used the word must probably a half dozen times or so in terms of what needed to happen. And they clearly sided with the quote unquote pro democracy demonstrators in the street. And they clearly expressed their frustration, disappointment. And again, I think the word anger is not too strong with what uh, President Mubarak uh, said. But the White House uh, has got very few levers. They can, they can say what they want publicly, they can say what they want privately. Vice President Biden has been talking a lot to uh, Omar Suleiman, the, uh, the vice president there. But the bottom line is we have precious little influence. The Egyptians ultimately have bigger stakes here than we do. And the Egyptian army is calling the shots. And the White House is as, as much a bystander, indeed more of a bystander, uh, than it is a participant. Well, Richard, let me also ask you about some uh, conflicting signals coming from Egypt's government. Yesterday afternoon, the ambassador to the United States from Egypt uh, started going on networks and saying, basically saying what Mika always says about what I say, just don't pay any attention to him. Uh, Mubarak has no power. He's transferred all the power to me. He's, he's nothing more than a figurehead. Uh, we are the de facto leaders uh, uh, here. Uh, what, how, much, uh, how much weight do we put behind that statement? Uh, we don't have any reason to put a lot of weight behind it uh, now. Look, yesterday, people's expectations were obviously 180 degrees different from what happened, and that's part of the problem. Expectations were raised and then, and then dashed. 
what you shared with Leon Panetta, I think, characterized official Washington. Their expectations, and then again, they were dashed by the uh, reality. Mubarak may have even changed his mind between morning and night. We don't know. But again, all we do know is that he's going to be in place, or wants to be in place, uh, until September. And we have to continue to hope for and push for a real, a real transition. But I don't think any of us know exactly how much power Omar Suleiman has. But more important, Joe, none of us really knows what is going to be the pace and sequence and substance of this transition. What sort of political powers would be transferred? What sort of civilians will be brought into government? What's going to be the nature of constitutional reform? When might elections be? Essentially, the fundamentals of the politics are completely unknown. What we do know, though, and this is really worrying, is that the army of Egypt and Omar Suleiman have put themselves, I think, in a, in a virtually untenable position. They have now so closely associated themselves with what you might call the ancien regime that they risk their legitimacy. They risk the violence that they've, they've been very anxious to avoid. So some days, and you know, some days when we're talking about this on the air, I feel that you could almost chart, what's the expression, maybe that the, the, this is getting back on the rails. Well, yesterday I had the sinking feeling that this is all getting off the rails. Yesterday was a really bad day for those of us who want to see this unfold in a potentially constructive way. All right, and uh, Richard, are you... As you speak, we're looking at live pictures, uh, Cairo, 1 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, then thousands upon thousands of people uh, crowding the city and tents still up. Willie, go ahead. Yeah, Mika, Richard mentioned the statement uh, that came out of the White House. I want to read it because it is strong. President Obama said, the Egyptian people have been told that there was a transition of authority, but it's not yet clear that this transition is immediate, meaningful, or sufficient. We therefore urge the Egyptian government to move swiftly to explain the changes that have been made and to spell out in clear and unambiguous language the step-by-step -step process that will lead to democracy and the representative government that the Egyptian people seek. The voices of the Egyptian people mm. must be heard. Wow, that is, that is a strong statement. And Mike Barnacle, take us... Uh, inside the White House. We actually were going to have uh, the chief of staff on and about half a uh, Chicago guy uh, and halfway through the day uh, we found out I'm, we found out he was not going to be here. We will not uh, ask you to quote the exact text of the email, <laughs> but it was written in sort of Chicago with a bit of a Chicago swagger. Yeah, a little flair. A little there. flair. Well, you know, I think obviously... My deepest regrets, Michael. I shall not be able to attend. It wasn't that. It no. was not that. Well, I think during the course of the day and the events last night, the, uh, the White House, the State Department, they were all in the virtual lockdown because they want to be all on the same page for this statement that was issued later in the day. But I'd like to ask Richard about the, the, the context of the day yesterday and its meaning for today. There is almost a feeling, I think, within certain circles, diplomatic circles, both in state and I think also in the White House, wondering whether this is an act of provocation on the part of the Mubarak regime to incite violence in the crowd in order to crack down on the crowd. What, what, what do you hear about that, if anything? There is that theory. Uh, the metaphor is that the government is both the arsonist and the fire department. And, you know, all along for 30 years in some ways, Mubarak has often portrayed his rule that only th is that's the only thing that stands between what Egypt is and disorder or Islamic radicals or, or what have you. What I can't tell, Mike, is whether the administration's anger and the strength of that statement is because some of them actually felt misled by the Egyptians or really they felt that they had to take their best shot now publicly, that things are beginning to go off the rails to unravel, and they felt that they really had to push back hard to try to get things moving in the direction of a real uh, political transition. Let me say one other thing. All of this is taking place against the context where the Egyptian economy is deteriorating badly. Uh, and that might ultimately be the, the biggest challenge facing this country, that whoever comes out of this political process, uh, whether it's some caretaker government or, or what have you, they're going to have to deal with an extraordinarily difficult economic situation that's going to border on, the, the, on a crisis. And that might be the biggest problem now facing Egyptians' future, or at least as much of a problem as the sort of politics we're seeing in the street. All right, Richard Haas, thanks very much. We'll be following this story uh, for sure. We'll be seeing you again. What's your gut on, on what the White House should do moving forward? This has been somewhat of a disaster in terms of communication, not on their part, but, boy, they're sort of going to get 
a little bit of a ripple effect. For They're us. in a no-win situation. Yeah. Uh, you talk to anybody in the administration, and they will express a frustration, not only at people on the left who are insisting that they go out mm -hmm. and demand freedom at once, but also they're hearing it for some, from, from some extremes on the right as well. The fact of the matter is the White House it, it has to worry more uh, than, than talking heads or bloggers they can't about look like the they're impact. imposing. No, they, they, they can't look like they're imposing our will on the Egyptian people. Yeah. Uh, they also can't look like they're pushing Mubarak out too quickly. Because, again, Egypt is not the only country in the Middle East. They're not our only ally in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, a lot of other states that are very important to us economically or militarily are saying, this is know, amazing. do not throw your friend of 30 years under the bus. They're our friends, too. And, and we're actually getting some statements out of Egypt, out of Saudi Arabia, Willie and other states that uh, they're saying let, let it run its course. Do not humiliate Mubarak. We all know he's leaving. And the White House has now tried both approaches. At the outset, the president said and the White House said Mubarak must leave immediately. Remember, then they stepped right. back early in the week, tried to give him some space to do what he was going to do. And now yeah. he's just kicked sand in their face again, leaving them not with many more options. Right. Yep. All right. We'll be following this uh, throughout the morning. But we are also here in Chicago. And boy, do we have a big show. Over